Um, I, of course, was a child of comprehensive education. I went to a good, comprehensive, free, state-run nursery, primary, secondary, and further education college. I went to the local school. There was no question about choice, because it was a question about community. You went with your friends to the local primary school, which is heavily, as uh, Phil tells me just now, uh, uh, highly, highly NUT uh, um, members. I went to the secondary school, where Phil now teaches, um, and then I went to uh, the local college, where then my mum as an NUT member after I left became the head of, you know, kind of. It was about an integration into the community, and it was about um, being part of a community system. Um, and the idea that, in fact, you have more choice if you fragment schools up, if you make them compete against each other, is frankly bonkers. The idea of the local artist coming into different primary schools, specialist science teachers or language teachers coming in and teaching a session a week at primary schools was the reality that I lived in. Not because my primary school was able to be an academy or something and get unqualified people from outside, but because as part of the local authority, they were able to make sure that teachers with those specialisations, maybe only needed one, one session a week, were able to come into the school at the primary level. You were able to link to the secondary school because you knew all your kids were going to go to that local secondary school and you were able to integrate much better in terms of that transition. And what we see now is a complete destruction of that kind of integrated education system. As I kind of touched on, my family is, is in, um, educationist through and through, not only with my mother, but my you know, aunt, my sister is just trained to become a teacher. Um, uh, but I think, what is the future of education as a teacher that she will have now compared to our mother or our aunt? And what I think about is the final stages um, where my mother was a teacher, where she ended up having to worry more about the bottom line at her college than actually about improving quality and standards. She had to worry more about the annual Ofsted inspection because the college was, was failing than actually about improving the, the college, you know, kind of, uh, and the perverseness of the whole system completely, um, uh, completely destroyed the love, uh, partly, of education for her. I look at my aunt, who was a specialist in, um, in race equality and diversity services in Gloucestershire, you know, kind of, who was able to focus on teaching um, refugee young children or, or traveller children. That service now completely gone in Gloucestershire. And in the latter years of her life, what did she spend her time doing? She became a glorified saleswoman, having to go from academy trust to academy trust, beg them to buy her service back in from the local authority. And when they decided that it didn't meet the bottom line requirements, that service vanished. That service that helped the most vulnerable in education. And that is what we will see continuing with the white paper that we have in front of us from the Conservative government. That continuing fragmentation of education. The destruction, actually, of education that helps the most vulnerable, particularly for special educational needs and for other groups of people where the engagement of the local authority is so, so vital. But not only that, the involvement of the local community being ripped out of education is also something that we should be seriously worried about. I've served my time as a, as a governor on a, on, on a local school. You know, my parents served their time as parent governors and community governors. But that idea that that will all be washed away, in fact, you won't even have governors for each schools, but you'll have a governing trust of a multi-academy trust that maybe tens, even hundreds of miles away, have no idea about the local circumstances, <coughs> is an absolute tragedy. And it is a further tragedy from what I experienced when I started working in the local youth service. Because when I started working in the local youth service, at least you had some integration between youth workers in the non-formal education sectors and teachers. You often use similar facilities. You were often employed by the same people. Now, it wasn't perfect. Right? You kind of, there, were, there were problems. Um, but youth work has been whittled away as a non-statutory service 
almost completely disappeared. And now that is what you're seeing with education. You'll see it whittled away <coughs> until it is the bare bones and nothing else in the form of education sector. And I think we should be seriously worried. But the question today is, is Labour learning lessons? And I think the answer, shortly, is yes, but far too slowly, and sometimes uh, with far too much resistance from some of the people within our party. And the reason for that is, um, there were ideologues within the Labour Party who thought that changing the structure of a school would suddenly make it improve. Well, no, the thing that made it improve, if they did improve, was investing greater resources into the school. Thought that making a head teacher focus all their time on balancing the books, mm -hmm. rather than being able to get someone in the local authority to think about that, and actually being able to lead a community of teachers in their school would be better, was wrong. And we need to, first of all, acknowledge that. And we need to move forward. And that's why um, I was really pleased that the Socialist Education Association nominated Jeremy Corbyn. The Socialist Education Association is the um, education affiliate to the Labour Party. Um, teachers and educationists can join, and I do urge you to join uh, the organisation, because it now has an in to many of the thinkings of the Labour Party. But we need that voice to get stronger, and we need it to get more radical. Because we need to be clear, the problem with this bill is not necessarily the compulsion element. And I understand the, the, the point that Kevin was making, that through the compulsion argument, you get the Tories on side. But actually, I don't think we should be arguing uh, that there's a problem with compulsion. That is one part of the bill that is right. It is right that running two or three or four systems in education is totally bonkers. It is right that actually expecting, you know, kind of some to be doing this thing and some to be doing that thing is totally bonkers. The idea that we should be compulsorily making sure schools are all under one framework actually is totally right. The problem with things like the bill and the Conservative government is not that compulsion element, but it is their direction, their solution is totally wrong. The compulsion should be every school should be under a local authority. The compulsion should be every school should have teachers and parents on their governing body. That should be the compulsion that we should be fighting for. So actually, I would argue that it's not that compulsion element that we should focus on at all. But it is the devastating impact of forcing everyone to go through an unnecessary change that will make things worse in the long run. It is, the, it is privatisation through the back door. That is, as Jeremy said yesterday, um, you know, kind of flogging off our state assets and, you know, kind of the family silver. That is where we should be fighting this bill. And that is where I hope the Labour Party will start fighting this bill. But we cannot do it without voices inside the Labour Party, your voices, very clearly saying the direction that we need to go very clearly to our shadow education secretary and to our leader. And I think that for the first time in a long time, we have their ear, but we need to make sure we're shouting in it darn loud enough so that they don't hear any of the other ideologues inside or outside the party. Thank you very much. Yeah.